Good morning. Welcome uh, to everyone. It is the 15th Sunday uh, after Pentecost, and uh, heavy material uh, today, uh, a heavy thought, a hard one to think about. Um, for those of us who are confessing believers in Christ, what a comfort to know uh, that, that this is exactly where Christ builds his church. Uh, and yet, that doesn't mean that the church is a glorious thing. It doesn't mean that the church is an easy thing at all. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, and that is uh, the, the theme before us. Uh, so we ask that our Lord in our worship and our conversation with him uh, today might strengthen us through his word and give us uh, the, the faith to, to pick up our cross and truly follow him in our life. Uh, service notes, we do have a, a canter again today. So uh, take note as we go through the service uh, of what is congregational singing, what is uh, uh, the cantor singing, the soloist, and uh, take note of that as we go. Now we begin with the opening hymn.
Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come in his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful, and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated.
Our first lesson for this morning is taken from Jeremiah chapter 15. Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me, and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending, and my wound grievous and incurable? You are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and deliver you from the grasp of the cruel. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is Psalm 121. Please note that the cantor will sing the verses and the congregation will sing the refrain and the glory be to the Father. Our second lesson is taken from Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brother and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is so to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Your words became a joy to me and the delight of my heart. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel, which will also serve as our sermon text, is taken from Matthew chapter 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
God's grace, God's mercy, God's real and true peace, brothers and sisters, are yours. He's given you his son to be your savior. The word of God we consider is the gospel lesson. I'll just read the closing paragraph. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Confession that Peter made about the content of his faith, who Christ was, the promised one of God from the Garden of Eden who would put the gates of hell and the forces of hell back in its hole. A confession that was so good in its content that Jesus said it's the very foundation upon which he would do the most beautiful architecture in history. He would build his church on that confession. We who are confessing believers in Christ have been built into that church, and we rest secure, knowing that Jesus promised the gates of hell would not overcome it. But Jesus never said that the forces of hell would not rage against it. In fact, that was a lesson that Peter learned all too quickly. Very quickly after the confession that he made that Jesus said was so good, Peter learned that the forces of hell were indeed, at that moment, raging against the church. Matthew says it was at that time that Jesus began to do some teaching of his disciples. He began to teach them, Matthew says, that the Christ must, must go to Jerusalem. Remember, they had withdrawn and they were north of Jerusalem and north of the hotbed, and now Jesus is saying that it is God's God's will, his foreordained way, that the Christ would now go back into the hornet's nest and suffer many things. From the teachers of the law, from Sadducees, the Pharisees, the elders... In fact, it was God's will that the Christ, the Son of the living God, would go into the hornet's nest, suffer many things from the religious leaders, and be killed at their hands, and then be raised from the dead. That didn't fit, not with the way that Peter thought that the Christ would carry out his ministry, that the promised king of Israel would in fact rule him, establish his kingdom. And so Peter at that moment, so soon after being commended for his words, pulled Jesus aside and sternly rebuked him. Never, Lord. Heaven forbid that this would happen, not to you. And the one who was commended so highly for the words before was rebuked so sternly for those words now. Yet behind me, Satan. Know your place, Peter. Don't ally yourself 
with the forces of hell. What a lesson that Peter learned, the disciples with him. It's a lesson you and I do well to learn this morning. It's pretty easy to understand, I suppose, as confessors of Christ that the devil and all of his demons will rage against us. That makes some degree of sense. I suppose it's pretty easy to understand that the unbelieving world caught in hedonistic pleasure, material pursuit, would rage against the church. Not so easy to understand that you can find the forces of hell right here, cloaked with love and concern and compassion. Even there, forces of hell rage against God's people. Two young teenagers who've been dating for a while and are getting along just swimmingly who decide that their love is so strong and so wonderful and so perfect that it needs to be taken to the next level. And the forces of hell rage against the church. A woman who is concerned for her friend, who has just been in her mind mistreated, taken advantage of, and as this friend talks about her co-workers who've done her wrong, the, the rage and the anger is there and the gossip is there and and this friend who, who just wants to validate her feelings and be there to support joins in the gossip and tears down the reputation of people she doesn't even know and the forces of hell rage against the church. A young man, a believer, strong, always has been, joins a bowling league of all things. When the opportunity presents itself to share the message of hope that is Christ Jesus with a friend on his team who's hopeless and despondent about what life has become, who finds no meaning and no significance in it, and this young man, out of fear of being rejected by his teammates and his friends, does nothing. The forces of hell rage against the church. Peter, out of love and concern for his Lord, allied himself with none less than Satan. What a lesson for the disciples to see that even within the believing community you can find Satan himself. But I don't think that is even the most overt or most covert of all ways that the forces of hell rage. Think of what Peter learned. The forces of hell didn't rage against him and his confession of Christ from outside. They attacked him from inside. And that's the truth, brothers and sisters. That the most covert enemy allied with the forces of evil 
lies within. It lies within in the things that we think about. Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men, of human things, of this worldly thing. How often our thoughts turn, always and only, to the material to pursuing careers and bigger houses. How often our thoughts, even concerning the kingdom, turn to, to thoughts like this, that somehow, some way, we ought be able to exist in this world as confessing believers in a way that, that appeases the world and eases the pain and blunts the rage that the world, and even Jesus says, is no doubt going to be there. and the forces of hell rage within against the church. You throw in the world's hostility and the hostility of Satan himself and it gets to be too much. It's a heavy load a very, very large cross to bear. And even there, in our despair over our own ability, the forces of hell rage when we forget the confession that we've been built on. Christ came to fight all of these forces of hell from without and from within. It's why he didn't entertain, even for a moment, not going into Jerusalem, not facing the elders, not being killed, not for a second. There wasn't one iota of a thought that somehow an earthly, glorious, peaceful, worldly kingdom would be what he would build. That wasn't it. And so he picked up his cross along with our sin and our weakness our inability. He picked up our animosity towards the church of God and he carried it right into Jerusalem. That's the confession that we make. That apart from the Christ, there is no life, no hope. Not within and not without. And so now Jesus says to you and to me who confess him that if we really want to follow him, then we have to follow him. Pick up our cross. Deny ourselves the worldly glorious inclinations of our heart that want to pursue worldly things, deny it, and follow him. And if you think it's impossible, just think of Peter. This man who was so out of line in scolding his Lord, The man, the confessor who would on Monday, Thursday face the forces of hell and deny his Lord, you find also in the beginning of the book of Acts. 
where he was in Jerusalem, eyeball to eyeball with those same elders and teachers of the law who had killed his Lord, and was being told by them that he should not teach and cannot preach in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, not once more. And this same man looked eyeball to eyeball to him and said, you determine for yourself whether we'll obey God or whether we'll obey you. But as for me, I cannot help but speak of the things that I have seen and I have heard. And he picked up his cross, literally, and followed his Lord right into heaven. We might look at Peter and say, wouldn't it be nice if when that inclination of our human nature joins and allies itself with Satan, wouldn't it be nice to have Jesus there scolding us and correcting us and admonishing us? Brothers and sisters, that's the only hope. I want to share with you a section of Psalm 119, and it really is a song that deals with the activity of God's word in our life. It's a prayer that God would be active in a confessor's life. And I want to share with you one section. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Jesus promises to be active in your life. He himself, in his word, to build your new man and that heart within, to continually, day by day, through the power of baptism that he has given you, refresh daily in his word, to scrape away the evil that resides within, the hostilities of your heart, and build you up into a servant, a confessor, a true believer. May the one, brothers and sisters, we confess, the one we so wish to follow in his word, in his supper, give you all you need so that you might follow that desire. May it be that as the forces of hell rage from within and from without, you're built into the very building that Jesus said he's going to build a building that all the forces of hell has no hope of toppling. Amen. May the peace of God that far transcends all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise as we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
In our prayers this morning, uh, we'll offer uh, several prayers. Uh, first, uh, Marv and Joan Matiak are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary this week. Uh, also, Dr. Peter Henning sent, uh, was a member of St. John's some time back, is also the father of Sue Deer, uh, passed away uh, last week as well, so we'll remember the family. And then Sandy Lemke uh, had her lower lobe on one of her lungs removed uh, in surgery on, on Friday, and it was successful. She's recovering now and hoping to go home, I think, uh, today. So we'll uh, thank God for that successful surgery. We pray. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with a fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Lord God, giver of life, health, safety, and strength, we praise you for having granted Sandy Lemke successful surgery. May she daily remember your goodness that she might serve you with a life that reflects a genuine thankfulness for this and all of your blessings. Lord God, you are the Lord of life and death. We thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Peter Henningsen, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought him to the knowledge of your son, Jesus. And we pray that you would comfort his family and all who mourn his death with your precious promises, cheering them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants, Marv and Joan Matiak, throughout the 60 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with an unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their Lord and their God. Hear us, Lord, as we now also bring you our private petition. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that they may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve your Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give to you his peace. 